time not from Olimo. <laughs> My name is Maja Kohek. I'm an anthropologist by profession. I'm working with the Association on A here in Slovenia and with Mr. Nolimo for a couple of uh, years in the field of cannabis use and uh, drug policy. So, uh, Mr. Noli Mal is working at the National Institute for, uh, of Public Health and he was not able to come to the event because of the trouble he already has with his supervisors because of his work on cannabis. So he asked me to attend this event and to present our past work to you. Um, I will just start with the presentation. As the title suggests, I will talk today about the science, ethics and politics um, and uh, in cannabis policy, actually. We are focusing on the illicit drug cannabis. Uh, I would like to put my presentation into the perspective of social responsibility, that is the responsibility of each one of us to act for the benefit of society at large. This is even more important, I think, in the realm of science and politics. So it first becomes clear that the most scientists and politicians are far from being socially responsible when it comes to illegal drugs. On the contrary, they eagerly defend the status quo and even oppress all of us opponents where they can. So what is actually wrong with uh, current drug policy in Slovenia? Uh, first, it criminalizes cannabis users. In most European countries, cannabis is still forbidden, so the criminalization of users is no real surprise. But when analyzing the public police statistics in Slovenia, we found surprising deviations from uh, the current decision makers that the Ministry of Health and Ministry of Justice uh, continue to ignore. So cannabis is the most, most commonly used illicit drug in Slovenia. Um, around 70% of all cases related to illicit drugs involve cannabis. The biggest issue is the discrepancy between the laws and the implementation of the laws in practice. So according to the law, only activities that suggest an intent to sell can be subject of a criminal offense. But the court's practice tells us a different story. So a research conducted in 2014 by the Faculty of Criminal Justice and Security in Slovenia aimed to analyze several cases related to illicit drugs, and they come to the following conclusions. So, they found out that most individuals are convicted for felonies um, because of possession of drugs for personal use. There were a lot of uh, sanctions with imprisonment. Uh, a lot of courts are overloaded with these cases of possession of illicit drugs for personal use. We have all overcrowded prisons. And there are great differences in the sentencing. For example, for the possession of similar amounts of cannabis, one can be treated as a felon at some courts and as a misdemeanor at others. So we have to bear in mind that the individual who are convicted of a felony because of possession for personal use, not with the intent to sell, are being highly stigmatized as drug dealers. Their financial income, careers, career possibilities are even more limited with the conviction, and moreover, they often come from prison with newly accumulated knowledge and skills or dependent on other drugs, so it's a vicious cycle. In Slovenia, you will be convicted, according to our court practice, for of a felony crime if you possess cannabis. To support the accusations, the court also prefers to have your confession, which is kind of forcibly acquired. The prosecutors, lawyers, the judges recommend you to acknowledge the guilt in order to lower your sentence. And most people follow this advice because they don't know better. 
Slovenia legislation, which supposedly decriminalized drugs in the 90s, used to continue to treat cannabis users as the worst criminals. So excessive criminalization of drug users is evident also from the police statistics. As we can see, uh, the European ratio between criminal offenses and misdemeanors are 18% uh, of felonies and 82 of misdemeanors, while the average ratio in Slovenia is a bit higher. But um, even more, uh, the, these high rates of criminal offenses in Slovenia are indication of excessive penalization rather than of high crime prevalence. This becomes even more clear uh, from the ratio between misdemeanors and felonies at individual police station units in Slovenia. For example, uh, the police administration unit Murska Sobota, which is not far from here, attracts the most attention since there is an average of approximately 70% of criminal offenses and 30% of misdemeanors. So a question can be raised about whether or not the majority of convicted drug offenders in Prekmurje are in fact criminals or just drug users that were being accused of, confessed to and sentenced for crimes that actually don't exist. So similar issues were raised by Dr. Katja Shudman-Stabs in a recent article about the anomalies in the Slovenian court, court practice. Since 2012, two great novelties came into practice in our le legislation, considering the Criminal Procedure Act. One is the agreement on the acknowledgement of guilt, and the other is the pre-trial proceeding. So the practice reveals that after this novelty was introduced, the courts generally pass the sentence on the basis of your confession. And the number of these confessions is especially high at the pre-trial proceedings. In the report of the State Prosecutor Office from 2013, again, the Murska Sobota District Office stands out with even higher numbers of confessions given at the pre-trial proceedings than at the second biggest office in Maribor. The author of the article quite legitimately raises the question whether the people in Prekmurje are outstandingly honest or do the judges and prosecutors benefit most from the quick verdict machinery. Many cases are closed after so-called informal negotiation without ad advocates, recordings or any control these informal negotiations are a clear violation of the law by those who represent the law. So, it seems like the Slovenian justice system benefits the most from the, these shortcuts, and in doing so, it criminal, criminalizes people who either uh, do not understand the procedure, are unable to set up the, a defense, or are acknowledging the guilt because of fear or insufficient knowledge. So the criminalization of drug users assume the, assumes the worst about the people who use drugs and in doing so it often punishes their vulnerability, increases stigma and is often unfairly and selectively enforced. Prohibition has all, also only limited impact in reducing the illicit drug market and criminal activity. We see that the drug use is still rising, new substances are emerging each day black market is flourishing and the courts are overloaded and the prisons are overcrowded. So how can we still defend such policy as good and effective? In comparison with drug use itself, the current drug policy is causing more harm by criminalization of drug users than the actual substance. This is, not, this is true not just in case of cannabis, but also other drugs such as psilocybin mushrooms, MDMA, LSD, and actually all the other drugs. Prohibition will never solve the issues of harmful drug, drug use, it will just add fuel to the fire. Which gets me to my second point. Uh, the obstruction of scientific research. In May 2015, we, by the, I mean Association of Aid, organized the third seminar about cannabis in Slovenia, where Dr. Sue Sisi spoke about the obstruction of her work. 
She was fired at the University of Arizona because of her research on cannabis. Now she still waits for NIDA's permission to make research on cannabis and PTSD. She has collected the money. She has all the resources. She just waits for the stamp. And she can wait for it for a long time because they don't have no deadline for the response. So she is just one example of how difficult it is for researchers to explore the medical potential of these forbidden fruits. And such suppression of research in medical cannabis is common also here in Slovenia, for example, at the National Institute for of, of, of Public Health. So in spite the rhetoric of openness in research, there are numerous examples of suppression, including pressure not to take research in the first place, institutional controls on dissemination of data, uh, and attacks on researchers who produce unwelcome results. So the methods of suppression are several. For example, there is there is vast public health funding for monitoring drug abuse, but none for the development in the field of medical use of cannabis. The information on the criminalization of cannabis user, users is kept a, a secret, especially if reveals information that might be used against the authority. It is nearly impossible to get permission needed to carry out clinical studies with cannabis on humans or only chosen scientists get the privilege to do it. Not to tell anyone that research has been done or that it is available uh, is one way of censorship. Not to reply to requests for information is another. Researchers are required to submit their work for scrutiny to superiors before it can be published. They can report only favorable findings important data is being ignored or discredited, is being submerged, diluted and misrepresented in large quantities of contrary data and so on. Some methods include also harassment, withdrawal of research grants, blocking promotions, spreading rumors and intrigues, blacklisting and other methods of mobbing. Not surprised, or surprisingly, no one in the academic scene is dealing with the hearts of prohibition or even medical benefits of the substance. They mostly deal with the hearts of drug use. So in the meantime, however, several thousands of studies have been carried out abroad that confirm beneficial effects of cannabis for serious of illnesses and also those which prove that long-term cannabis use poses no serious harm for the user. But still, there are even more studies funded by governments and pharmaceutical industries that advoc advocate the contrary. In my opinion, the most harmful consequence of current drug policy, besides the criminalization of drug users, is the unavailability of these substances for medical use. And the obstruction of scientific research plays a crucial role in it. In Slovenia, over 30 employers, I think 35, work in the field of drug use at the Ministry of Health. They receive salaries each month, and all of them are just reproducing the prohibition nonsense of cannabis being very harmful for your health with, addiction, with high addiction possibility and similar nonsense. There are no, no signs of ob objectivity, honesty, or real scientific research in their work. These tactics of obstruction that I was talking about before as far from being, are far from being socially responsible and have harmful consequences not only for these dissident researchers, but for society at large, and somebody has to take responsibility for it. A lot has to be done in the future to ensure effective and just drug policy that will take into account also the harms caused by current drug policy. At the end, it is the, the responsibility of public institutes, scientists, governments, and politicians to ensure the availability of cannabis for medical and non-medical use, to ensure independent scientific research, 
to ensure appropriate quality, safety and support measures for users and most importantly to treat drug users as free citizens. And a state which makes cannabis legally available for medical purposes should also ensure the professionals, policymakers and patients honest and appropriate information, establish the cooperation between farmers and the state, uh, ensure quality control, ban or limit advertising, not punish people who use these medicines and closely monitor the impact of the changes, including unknown benefits and unintended effects. And lastly, it is upon us, activists and users, that we continue to demand from our governments to act socially responsible, respect our human rights, and give us citizens the possibility to choose our drug of choice without being prosecuted prosecuted because of it. As a society, we face many challenges. Learning about cannabis and its medicinal value most certainly ranks in the near top. And I'm confident that the scientific and research community will eventually rise to that challenge. But we should not forget that it is the responsibility of all of us to not let it be suppressed anymore. Thank you for your time. To you, Maya, you surprised us with this information. Uh, yes, uh, but in the uh, first Sabota region, we have uh, World Ten Congress, and we play all around the world. And so, uh, uh, I say without word, police guys uh, and uh, judge guys uh, don't punish us. So we are not so bad. Uh, we are not. Uh, uh, even not users of uh, hemp or cannabis, uh, many of us uh, just um, we just share the knowledge and uh, we just uh, wish uh, to be better and uh, we care for law in Slovenia and so this is uh, important too because uh, I am I I feel myself that I am all the time in the, in the eye <laughs> but never mind uh, Maya. Um, how long do you need for this uh, that you keep uh, together this information? Um, so we collected this information for a couple of years actually. It's been done by uh, a lot of people actually who had a lot of problems with the police. So they were actually kind of, they had to do it in order to uh, protect themselves and to try to win at the courts without success till now. So um, we try to analyze the statistics from 2002 or 2003 on. Uh, and I mean, it's quite uh, surprising information and I had to check for myself it's, if it's really true. And I was devastated when I saw the, the numbers, the official police statistics, which, which say that we are all criminals, we are not users, in, in Murska Sobota. So we very hard work uh, in uh, registration of uh, medical cannabis already in Slovenia. I hope that we are not criminals in this way. Uh, so we uh, use time all the time in ministry all this week uh, with uh, government, uh, lead government, which one care for these papers and I hope that uh, we are good guys in the uh, eyes of uh, uh, global audience. So Maya, uh, you was uh, last in the World Ten Congress. Uh, big greetings to your uh, professor Dushan Nolimal. And uh, I hope that we will see him uh, next year with his uh, precious knowledge. And so, global audience, we go again. Um, we will be quiet one year, but we will work very, very, very hard that the world, world will be better and that, um, yeah, that we will make the progress uh, and we will be here next year 
in a bigger place and in better place. Thank you very much, and we see you in World Tank Congress 1900. <laughs> 2016. <laughs> 2016. <laughs> <laughs>